Thank you, Pam. That's uh, we're in the middle of a, a, a series that deals with uh, fear. We we looked at God dealing with the fear of Mary, with the declaration, "Do not be afraid" or "Fear not." Um, we're going to, in Bible study today, unpack this a little more in terms of three different kinds of fear. Uh, the, the kind of fear we talked about last week with Mary was a fear of uh, uh, what God is asking us to do or to believe in a world that can actually be hostile to Jesus. Uh, also, today, then, we look at a kind of fear of uh, what people think of me. And uh, that's as he comes to Joseph. Next week we'll look at a, a fear that the shepherds have, a fear of being unworthy and lowly, too lowly for God to care about. And, uh, and so as we uh, look at this fear today, there's uh, the idea that we're all in different places in regard to the fear of what others think. And I don't want to confuse caring about what others think versus fear of that. Because I think God does care about what people think and that's why He is in the business of trying to change and renewing their mind and their thinking as He did with us. And so yeah, does God, yeah God cares about what people think and I think that's a big reason He came to Joseph because He knew Joseph cared about the same thing. The problem comes is when we're afraid of what others think. And, and that's something that I've shared with you before, uh, you know, because I think we all uh, want others to be happy, want them to be pleased. And sometimes we can slip into looking at that as more important than what God actually thinks and is trying to do. In other words, we do the same old thing that happened in the garden and we try to play God in people's lives. <laughs> and that's not a good place to be. Not when we're to be His instruments. And so as we look at this story today, we see uh, Joseph uh, confronted with a decision to make. Does he make the easy decision, which he shares, or does he, um, does he make the right one? I, I think of this uh, situation, we've got to understand it as we get into this lesson today. Uh, he was engaged to Mary. Uh, and, and we do not look at engagement in the same light at all. Uh, that was a binding agreement back then. In fact, the ceremony that we have at the end of the engagement is a ceremony they would have at the beginning of the engagement. The endowment was given over to the patriarch side of the family to add to the home, to get it ready to... And, and this binding agreement was as much like our view of marriage today. But the biblical view of marriage for a Jewish person was when the two became one flesh. When they came together in union in their sexuality. Another thing that we have all messed up today in our society. And so, what he was faced with was a pregnancy in his engagement he finds out that the one he is betrothed to, the one that he's engaged to, the one he is basically uh, promised to, and there's no way out except for a divorce. And they had divorce for those situations. And so, as we get into this today, I, I just want to uh, imagine, first of all, we got to look at what Mary thought. You know, how can this be, for I'm a virgin? And now we're getting into the mind of Joseph through the Scriptures and what he must have thought. 
either Mary was totally crazy or she was a liar. And yet, I want you to notice Joseph's approach to the situation. As we get into this in Matthew, um, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is where the challenge for Joseph begins. It's where he starts to learn a life lesson that is imper- a very important life lesson, not just for Joseph, but, but for each and every one of us. And, um, and so we see in verse 19 his heart, his, his desire to be godly and to do what God wants is because Joseph was a, her husband, do you hear that? Binding. Uh, he was a righteous man and he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Now that might not sound too bad in our translation, but it's horrifying. Remember Jesus with the woman caught in adultery? What were they going to do to her? They were going to stone her. To make this a public affair would have been consummate, uh, paramount to her being stoned to death. And the public disgrace of her family that would have come with that. But he cared about her. And cared about what others thought. And so he had chosen to do this quietly for her sake. And so as you look on in this, he decides to do probably the harder thing, but yet easier in the long run for him. And so, as we look at this, uh, the, the life lesson that he learns here is that pleasing God, and I think we've all learned this a long way, pleasing God sometimes, or maybe even often, means uh, disappointing other people. Could be people in our, in our family. Could be people that are friends or people we work with. And, uh, and so that's what he's faced with. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. In other words, in the King James, fear not. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Why he needs uh, to make the decision he needs to, why he needs the encouragement to do what he needs to do is for a much bigger picture than he being betrothed or being married to a woman and have children and, and... live his life as easily as possible under the persecution they were in. It was was so much bigger than that. And so as we look at this, if you're taking notes, I just want to, you might want to write this down because it really applies to every one of us. Becoming obsessed with what people think about us is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about us. Did you catch that? Becoming obsessed with what people think about us is the quickest way to forget what God really thinks of us. And and by the way, that's why Paul would plead and encourage God's people to not get in the habit of not meeting together anymore but to gather together to remind each other just what God does think of us. That He really does think we're worth dying for. That it's His love that causes Him to move toward us and to remind us that, yes, 
we are forgiven. Yes, Jesus did die for us, His own Son. And yes, we are His saints. You are pure, holy, and righteous in the sight of God. Which is hard to remember when we have people telling us what's wrong with us. I remember back in, in high school. Uh, I found out I liked uh, a lot of different things. I liked long hair. So I would wear long hair and ride Bronx. So the cowboys that didn't know me would want to beat me up because I had long hair. And the other long hairs in town didn't like me because I liked to listen to country music and ride Bronx. And it was often a kind of a, especially at the dance after the rodeo, uh, I found myself ducking a lot. <laughs> and and it, But that's the kind of world we live in. We live in a world where people are going to criticize, they're going to look at us, and, and rightfully, in my case, a lot of times it was deserved. <laughs> Especially by my brother that I like to push his buttons. But the good news is the reverse of that statement I just made. Because the good news is, is that when we become obsessed with what God thinks about us, it's the quickest way to forget what others think about us. Let me run that by you again. That's so important. When we become obsessed with what God thinks about us in his holy word, it's the quickest way to forget what others think of us. It doesn't mean that we don't care about that anymore, but it means we're freed from the fear. And we're freed to be able to do what we need to do following God's will for us. So, that brings us to uh, the reality that you can't please all the people, or any of the people all the time, or all the people any of the time, or you just can't please people. Right? But here's something we got to remember. We can please God. And in fact, He's already pleased with us. In the cross of Jesus. He's completely Please, there isn't anything we can do to make him love us any less or think less of us. And so living for God instead of people is what we want to focus on for the last few minutes here. Uh, and, and to do that, I just want to put up, first of all, if, if you're not ready to be criticized, then you're probably not ready to be uh, used by God. Uh, when we step out as believers in uh, a lot of ways and we follow God's will and word for our life, it puts us in the crosshairs of criticism. And we need to be ready for that, both as individuals and as a church. Uh, when we teach what God's word says about our sexuality, uh, about marriage, uh, about abortion, about uh, about our worldview, uh, even as something as, as big but yet basic as creation. When, when we follow uh, God's will for us of obedience and being obedient to his word, we put the crosshairs on ourselves in regard to criticism from the word. How foolish you are to believe a fairy tale like this. That's part of the criticism. When we, uh, when we start to follow God's will for us, I just watched a program uh, my daughter and I would watch together. Um, what was it called? Oh, uh, I just went to MacGyver. It's not MacGyver. It's, uh, oh, gosh. I just had a brain burp. But, but what happened in this show just shocked me because, uh, oh, uh, Longmire, I should have been a have you ever heard of Longmire? Longmire is having a relationship with this psychologist, and he's very awkward about his uh, sexuality, and she's, you know, they're wanting to do what you name, normally see on TV and everything, and, 
And finally, uh, he just gives up. And he says, you know, I- I'm sorry. He, he starts by apologizing. But my wife and I, we waited. That might sound corny. <laughs> and I'm going, what? No, that's not corny. But that's how it was portrayed. And yet, that's the first time I ever heard of anybody waiting for their sexuality until until married. And I'm going. And, and Kylie looks at me and she goes, can you believe that? We don't hear that today, right? It's corny. <laughs> that's, that's, he was criticizing himself. And uh, that's often how things are portrayed in the world we live in today, whether it's our sexuality, whether it's the way we use our language and our words. Like when we're worth certain people and the, the vulgar language can just fly. And then it might even slip a little when we get somewhere else. Or we can turn it off. Or, and, and yet, without even making a judgment on others, to change that behavior is an, a little act of obedience. And that brings us to our next point here. Uh, and that is, extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. The obedient life of Jesus for us and in our place started with the small acts of obedience of Mary and Joseph, of following God's will. And and by the way, they had no clue what they were getting into, right? I often think, okay, Mary and Joseph, okay, if we do this, how how are we going to raise this kid? What's going to be our, uh, how, are we, how are we going to correct him? How are we going to, are, are we going to swat him on the bottom or are we going to stand him in the corner? Oh, wait a minute. He is the pure, holy son of God. Maybe he will put us in the corner. I, I'm sure they didn't have this all figured out, right? I think we got general idea with Mary that she just treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. Did they know that their son was going to drive him crazy by disappearing right after his bar mitzvah? Of all things, talking with the priests in the temple. I mean, come on. Was he going to kind of go crazy? Was he going to go out there? Was he going to not eat and sleep? And we're going to have to go to the house and try to extract him out of there and get him home? And, you know, he's, he's embarrassing us. People are saying he's crazy. They were fearful about what others were thinking. Did they have it all figured out? No. Do we have it figured out when we get married? (laughs) Do we have it figured out when we have children? (laughs) No, but we have steps of obedience. And we trust who? We trust the Lord because it's in that that those fears that come with all that He asks us to do in those little acts of obedience make a difference. An act of obedience of reading the Bible. You know, we we live in a society that is uh, known to be fairly biblically illiterate. Uh, The surveys show that. But the simple act of obedience of reading God's Word and studying God's Word, we have no idea the work of God that that will set forth. When we step out in obedience, God is there to work. I remember being called to start a mission church in California. I didn't have a clue about how to start a mission church. So I went down to the land that we, we had, this district had purchased, and I started knocking on doors around there, and it was, it was incredible. I never met so much criticism in my life. They couldn't believe that we would put a big church with a big parking lot and all that traffic in their backyard. I'm going, ha, this isn't working too well. <laughs> but then... Uh, 
there was a woman there, uh, Susan Vickery. She was an AAL rep. She gave me a name. She says, you ought to call on this person. They're in the area. They just moved into the area, and they may be interested in the new mission church. I go, great, somebody interested in the new mission church. I went and knocked on their door. They turns out they were friends of one of the people I had visited by the land. They ended up talking with them about it, and the people by the land ended up becoming supporters of it. Simple act of obedience of knocking on a door. When God lays someone on your heart that he wants you to invite to God's house, to a Bible study, to worship, but we become fearful of what they might say, we'll become fearful it might hurt our relationship if I do that simple act of obedience. And yet, if you don't, how can God work? You see, the last thing that we see in this text um, is what Joseph responds. And it was as simple as Mary's response. And that was when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. Simple response of obedience that led to the Savior of the world coming as God in flesh in our place to die for us, to rise again, and now to sit in glory as our King. So you might say, well, Gee, Pastor, that was, that was a pretty big deal that he asked them to do. Uh, and, and after all, Jesus is already born, and he lived and he died and he rose again. So what's the big deal for us? And here's the big deal. There are people's hearts that are dead, and Jesus hasn't been born there yet. That's the big deal. Our little acts of obedience, of love, and care for them is everything in regard to Jesus being born anew in the hearts of people. That's why we're here. That's what he approaches us to do. In Jesus' name.